would say the best way to continue to decolonize your mind is to understand that it's an ongoing process we're taught we're saying the words unconditional love but it's really difficult and until you get into a situation where you actually have to practice that um which is is every day right when someone pisses you off like you still have to show them unconditional love whether it's family or a stranger or whatever the case may be it's an ongoing process as to what our relationships are with each other um and so yeah remembering that remembering how you show up for yourself so when we say decolonizing we're actually saying we want to reclaim that which is naturally us we don't say, let's go start and start fighting other people. That's not what we are talking about. We are saying, reclaiming our dignity. And by this dignity, we are saying we are using the power of storytelling. Because first, you need to even know that you have this dignity before you can reclaim it. We need to explore our stories, research and learn then examine our own stories today. What has changed? How hasn't it changed? What are the stories we are telling and sharing with our own children, with one another? How does it actually differ from the narratives that have been told about us? Are we saying anything different than what the oppressors are saying? And how are these stories being told about us? Do we challenge those narratives when we hear them? Or are we desensitized? And do we collude with them? Hello and thank you for checking out this video. I'm Obehi Ewanfo, the host of the African Diaspora Storytelling Series. Every two weeks, we meet up on LinkedIn to talk about different ways we can leverage the power of storytelling as people of African descent. Now, this is it. We are united in millions of Africans in the diaspora through the power of our story. It does sound like what you are interested in. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and share this video with your friends who might need it. Now, back to today's conversation. This conversation is particularly important. It's important for us uh, in the diaspora, but it's also important for people that are in Africa because what is tied all together is the same. So this is our heritage, our story that we are going to use to heal ourselves. And of course, I'm also happy that um, Sister Gora will be uh, taking some time to explain some of this thing later on. Uh, because uh, we are talking of healing, we are talking of how to use the power of story, how to connect to our root, our source, where we are coming from, because we are not products of the academia. We were not generated from the computer. We are real people. We are real human beings. And there is a deep history behind us. So this is what storytelling helps us to do, so that it helps us to stand on the ground. We are not standing on the sand. You know, there is a difference between standing on the ground, a solid ground, are standing on mere sand. You know, when you stand up, they will call it sand, sand in that you, are, you will be moving because you are not really stable. Uh, but when you stand on the solid ground, which is your history, your heritage, uh, your story, that is what builds up the solid ground upon which you are standing. Then you become immovable. Nothing can shake you. Nothing can shake you. All right, so like I say here, we don't have to wait for anybody. This is the time that we have set for this particular conversation. So we are seizing this time. It's important for us. We are taking it. Let's do what we have to do. My name is Ubehi Ewafo. I'm originally from Nigeria. I am the author of the Storytelling Mastery, which basically takes people and businesses uh, through the ABC of storytelling. Uh, why that is important is that it helps people uh, to sort of move beyond just the mere statistics so that, uh, like I was saying before, the foundation, the who you are, your story, your heritage can actually be the, the solid ground upon which you stand. And in the area of business, is the same too. And of course, uh, today, we are not only really going to be talking about business, even though that can be part of it, we are talking about the diaspora storytelling. 
And a conversation that we have is going to be looking at how do we decolonize our mind? Because that is very important for us. Because until we do that, we're not going to go very far. It is absolutely fundamental that we decolonize our mind so that we can move to the next level. A while ago, I was interviewing a very good artist from Senegal who is living in Milan. And of course, the conversation was a huge one because we're talking about different things relating to Africa. Then I said what I often say, that our salvation do not depend on other people. It depends solely and entirely on us. Maybe some other persons can help us, but this is our job. This is our work. And we're going to do the work, whatever it takes. We do it now, or we do it in 20,000 years to come, this is our call. We must respond to it. All right, so the conversation is uh, using storytelling as a decolonizing tool for Africa and African diaspora. Now, I want to pass the mic to Nakasha. Nakasha, please, uh, what is your first take on today's conversation? Hi, um, yeah, my name is Nakasha. I am an author and business owner and decolonizing the mind is the topic. It's very interesting. Um, one, we've talked about it in a lot of different previous um, conversations we've had. And I think the biggest thing is um, getting to the point of like self-actualization. Honestly, oh, let me give a little bit of transparency. I'm super um, exhausted. I just got off of a trip. I'm in Tunisia right now, by the way, but um, I just got out the airport. But Self-actualization, self-love, I think is the biggest thing that we have to focus on, um, not even particularly relating to uh, a race, but just as a, as a species, like understanding the conception of love, unconditional love for self, I think is um, a really important factor of decolonizing the mind because we've been so conditioned to think a certain type of way as far as like who we are supposed to be within the, a system and a structure um, to benefit someone else and not our own selves. So we, we've been conditioned not to develop our own institutions and philosophies and ways of thinking. Um, we've been conditioned to support a system as in like you talking about the university or we're not robots thinking like computers, but we've been so conditioned in this generation to utilize the education system to get to where we can go. And then even when you're in that institution, at least from my experience being um, at one of the best institutions in America, like people are only thinking about how can they become employees. And I think that's um, something that needs to be decolonized. Like, why are we always thinking about being employed by someone else. And of course, like we human resources is the most important thing, but that shouldn't be the end goal of your life of how you expect to make a means. And I think oftentimes we've became so embedded in that structure because of what is generated through capitalism and racial capitalism and all those interesting Thing. So I think that once you understand unconditional love on a uni on an internal and then a universal level, everything else starts to unravel, right? And like your relationships starts to get better, but whether they're family, platonic, or um, romantic, you start to actually um, receive what you feel about yourself, and then things can manifest forward. So love. All right. Thank you so much for that, Nakasha. That, that is really important because we are, first of all, going to love ourselves. Because if we don't love ourselves, then whatever we are doing is going to be superficial. It's not going to land. Uh, because how are we going to love other people if we don't even love ourselves? Uh, and this is an argument that is going to come around again and again uh, in our demography. In that, like uh, Nakasha was saying, uh, we, when we go through this educational system, we are mm, educated to be like sort of mini robot because the education is very complex uh, sometimes in that it's very expensive to educate somebody because the institution or the state do not have these resources to do that. They do a kind of standardized form of just grouping people and making people fit into little buses that are there 
that they have created. So they're not really looking for the potential of the individual, of the people. They're looking up how to put the people together. They get the best that they want. Then for the rest, you just need to serve the master. Well, that life originally was designed in a way that each and every one of us should become the best that we can be. Not few of us, but each and every one of us. And if we do this, life will become huge. Life will become really more beautiful than it is today. Because we will reduce the suffering because each of us would have been able to fully, fully involved. And particularly for us, uh, people of Africa and African descent, we feel this a lot. Because like Nakasha also was saying, the capitalism that we have, that we are practicing, is a racist capitalism. For this reason, we are disadvantaged in that. So we need to look for a way to decolonize our mindset so that we need to do what honor us, what honor our people, what give dignity to us. And these things are not automatic, particularly when you are looking at this uh, racial agenda that is set up against us. So we are not going to get salvation through that system until we love ourselves, like Michael Mills would say. You need to love who you are. Love every part of you, your hair, your color, the sound of your voice. There is nothing in you that you should be ashamed of. You really need to love yourself. And that is going to be very important for us. And this is going to help us to even heal ourselves because we can heal ourselves. I remember the other day I was interviewing an assistant uh, professor in the U.S. They were talking about African history, talking about uh, African heritage. But of course, we also talked about the epigenetic that many of us are suffering from. And it's something very important that we can even heal our ancestors because all of us are connected. None of us is exempted. None of us is free as long as we are not free. So by healing yourself, you are also healing generations that have come before you and the generation that is going to come after you because you are part of the whole. You are not just a law as a singular entity. You are part of several thousands of people in a line of generations. So it is important that we decolonize our mind so that we can help many, many, many other people that we are not even able to see or touch just now. So this is fundamental. Now, talking of healing, I would like to pass the mic to Sister Gloria because she is an expert on ancestral healing. And I don't think uh, uh, anything is more important than that today. Please take it from me. Thank you, Brother Obehi. <clears throat> Greetings, everybody. Uh, I greet you in my Yoruba language, Alafia. Thank you for being here. And Sister Nakasha, let me just say, you know, welcome to you from your travels. Talk about commitment. You're just arriving from Tunisia. Uh, so that's uh, being intentional and being here today. So thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Sister Basia, well, you know, you know I'm a fan. So nice to see you. So my name is Gloria Tinu Ogumbadejo. <clears throat> I'm uh, a Nigerian from the Yoruba culture. I'm an ordained minister, a psychotherapist, mental health advocate, a writer, and a certified ancestral lineage healing practitioner. I support African women ministers who want to incorporate spirituality in their ministry. I support Africans in the diaspora who are looking for cultural reconnection, emotional, psychological, intergenerational healing, strengthening their identity, tapping into their intuition, bringing harmony and balance into their lives, reclaiming cultural traditions. The topic today is such an important one and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it goes far and wide because it's really, it, it, it is the time to talk, to talk about this and we can't talk about it enough. And like my sister said, we've talked about it in different uh, configurations, but you know, we need to continue talking about it. You know, storytelling transcends borders, languages, generations, it's a universal language that connects us with our past, present, and future. You know, Africa is a continent rich in culture, history, and diversity. It's been called the cradle of civilization. Yet the West has managed to maintain a narrative that only focuses on the worst aspects. We're seeing it every day. The richness and humanity that resides and flows from the continent is often overshadowed 
misrepresented and silenced by colonial forces. We need to reclaim our stories in order to decolonize our minds. You know, the, our minds have never had an opportunity to recover, to heal from all the damage received. There's no space for healing as the trauma continues and is relentless. We have to create our own healing spaces with intention and rigor. We can heal the wounds of our ancestral lineage through the transformative power of storytelling. You know, throughout history, narratives have been used to oppress, marginalize, and control. They still continue to do that. But we have an opportunity to grab the power of our voices as a community to rewrite the script, create new narratives, and reclaim our agency. Colonialism sought to erase indigenous cultures, languages, and traditions, imposing a dominant narrative that depicts Africa and its people as inferior, primitive, and uncivilized. You just have to turn on the media. You know, <laughs> the recent uh, travels of Meghan and Harry, I've never seen a people fall over themselves desperate to misrep misrepresent uh, Africa and its people. These narratives continue to linger in our collective consciousness, perpetuating stereotype, biases, and systematic inequalities. You know, through storytelling, we reclaim our voice, assert our identity, and challenge the dominant narrative imposed upon us. Decolonization begins within ourselves, it requires on learning the narratives of oppression and relearning our history, culture, and heritage. By critically examining our stories, we the stories we tell and the stories we consume, we dismantle the structures of colonialism and cultivate a liberated consciousness. Our ancestors endured centuries of trauma displacement and exploitation under colonial rule. Their experiences are etched in our collective memories. Make no mistake, these memories influence our beliefs, behaviors, and our relationships. These memories are also up against all the gaslighting, assaults, retriggering, retriggering attempts to recolonize our minds, which on some level, in my opinion, is worse than the physical chains. Because when the mind is in shackles, then we do the work of the oppressors. They don't have to do anything. We perpetuate the damage on ourselves. This is evident in how we hamper each other or one another's progress at times unconsciously, how we struggle to come together on things that really matter and not on inconsequentials and rubbish. We need to come together and tell new stories. This is our work today. We have no excuse. When you think of all the pain and suffering our ancestors went through, they didn't have all the privileges we have today. Supporting one another, building up one another, telling new vibrant stories about one another, it has to be intentional. It, it, it just doesn't happen on its own. We have to really make an effort to make it happen, to tell these stories, because we're bombarded every day with all kinds of things that are trying to, you know, that, that we're fighting to get our mind, to control our children's minds. So we have to be intentional. Ancestral lineage healing is the process of acknowledging, honoring, and reconciling with the past to heal intergenerational wounds and create a path towards wholeness. By reclaiming our stories, we reclaim our power. We celebrate the resilience, wisdom, and beauty of African cultures and civilizations. If we really understand the beauty of our traditions and our cultures, we will be screaming at the top of our voices rather than hiding or, or ignoring or, or even engaging in, in, in in, in castigating and, and, and speaking ill of our, our culture. How dare we do that? 
Participating in ancestral lineage healing is an act of self-love and collective liberation. It requires introspection, empathy, and a willingness to confront uncomfortable truths. By reconnecting with our roots, honoring our ancestors, and engaging in ceremonies of remembrance, we forge a deeper sense of belonging and purpose. We must reclaim, reshape our narratives to reflect authentic, diverse, and indigenous perspectives. This is how we decolonize our storytelling, by integrating our ancestral powers, our ancestral stories into modern narratives. Reaffirm, we reaffirm the richness and validity of African cultures and histories. We need to explore our stories research and learn, then examine our own stories today. What has changed? How hasn't it changed? What are the stories we are telling and sharing with our own children, with one another? How does it actually differ from the narratives that have been told about us? Are we saying anything different than what the oppressors are saying? And how are these stories being told about us? Do we challenge those narratives when we hear them? Or are we desensitized? And do we collude with them? By sharing stories of our ancestors, our ancestors' strength, innovation, and resistance, we counteract stereotypes and reclaim our rightful place in global history. Add to that our own individual and collective stories of resilience, accomplishments, struggles, all of it. Like my brother said, there's nothing to be ashamed of. If anything, we're here. We're still standing. We're, we're accomplishing. We're successful. So all the struggles that we've been through are all a part of what has brought us here to where we are today. Let us tell our own genuine, authentic stories. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much for that. I love that. I really do. I really do. This is this is the power of all of us. Uh, the only way we can get out of this quagmire is when we unite our efforts together. Because by uniting our efforts together, there is no uh, there is no storm that we cannot weather. There is no obstacle that is beyond us. It is only when we remain in our in our petty little angle, thinking that ah, it is about me and all about me that we will fail. Because it is not about me as a person or you as a person. It is about us, all of us. That is why at the center of what we are doing in A-class is, is that we, it, we believe so much that we, just as an organization, us, we do not have all the solution. So we are intentionally reaching out to other experts within the diaspora, and we are saying, let's create the solution together. Let's bring a little bit of you, a little bit of me, a little bit of him, a little bit of her. When we put it together, we'll be able to find a better solution. Maybe I need to explain that uh, more. You see, there are a lot of experts within the African diaspora, whether you are in the UK or in US or in Canada or in any other part of Europe, but as far as Asia, there are a lot of experts among us, people who are really, really good in what they are doing from the field of academia, research, economy, finance, politics, I mean, negotiation, able to communicate, people who can really write very well. But none of these bigger than life individuals can do it alone. So this is why we are insisting that we need to look for a way to cut across, to look beyond the petty differences that we have among us and let us work together. Let's look for a way to work together because if we do, then we will be able to leave a better legacy behind for other people that are going to come. Just now before we started to record, um, I was just sharing with uh, Sister Gloria uh, talking about our consistency here because we are really consistent here and we are doing it intentionally. That I was saying, 
imagine, for example, the speech that were made by uh, Marcus Garvey or all those speech that were made by uh, Martin Luther King at the time. None of us were there. I was not there, but I can still listen to those speech today. And it made me feel good. That is how I know that what we are intentionally recording today is going to make somebody feel good even 200 years from now. So we are doing this intentionally. So what I'm really telling us is that we need to continue. If we know what we are doing is good, let's continue. It doesn't matter whether you have a million followers or just two people that believe in you. Keep on doing it because you are going to change somebody along the line. Maybe the person is not born yet. Because remember that us, as identity is defined, is a person who is connected to the ancestors, who is also connected to the unborn. Until these two extra, they are not really sort of detached from you, which is before you and after you are put together, we cannot really call you a human being. So that a human being, therefore, is the one who creates this connection between what has been before you and what is going to come after you. I'm talking about maybe something up to like 500 years from now. Those children that are going to be born, they are part of who you are. So they are the reason that we are here. We know that we are doing this intentionally also for them because they are part of who we are. Using storytelling as a decolonizing tool for Africa and Africans. Now, I will pass the mic to Dr. Mancia. Please go ahead. Tell the people who you are and your first take on the conversation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good night. Good evening. Depending on where you are from, I want to, first of all, give a shout out to my esteemed colleagues, Gloria and Nicosia. I'm so, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So happy that you could join us even as you travel. Love your perspective on love as a decolonizing tool in storytelling. Love your perspective, Gloria, on the healing of telling our stories that would heal us. I I want to, to put a take in as a as an educator that uh in my opinion storytelling is more than a cultural artifact. It is really a dynamic tool for decolonization because it, it carries so many different interpretations and meanings and so many personal and in-depth experiences that even if it is told from another's perspective, it is a different story that is told because it carries a different impression on the person telling, even if they are telling your story. And so it is very important because storytelling helps in my mind to you to reclaim and share your story and through this, as Africans, we can assert our identity and preserve our heritage because it is our own unique and original story that can, in fact, inspire future generations. Because as, there, as, we, as we begin to connect meaningfully in the world, if we tell our story unapologetically and with authority and the assertion and ownership that makes our stories lasting and impressive, then we have the power to channel and confront decisively the global narratives that represent us and that contribute to an inaccurate representation of who we are and an understanding of how we have been affected by our experiences whatever shape or form they came in and how what we take with us that make us so resilient. I, I want to look at an example of what I'm describing. As I follow Rwanda very closely, it is a nation that I really admire because the leader has managed to, to make decolonization come alive in a way that can only be admired. And also it is something that has made persons become afraid and, and fear drives hate because it is not just a political process. It is also a cultural one. So he, he has reclaimed the language of his people 
the knowledge of his people, and the ways of life that colonial powers attempted to suppress or erase in that group. He has managed to do it very well. So persons have reclaimed their identity, preserved the language and culture because of the, I, the personal ownership and collective resilience that that brings. It has empowered the communities in this nation. It has educated and healed persons. What do we mean? It has changed the mindset that persons know, understand the redistribution of resources, the, the self-sufficiency that comes from collectively banding together to preserve a heritage, to preserve the dignity of a people who had that as a birthright. When we are born, we come into this world, whatever way we come, but we, we must live with a certain amount of dignity because we now accept and know and embrace who we are and our, our history and use it to perfect our future. And so this self-sufficiency must be economic, it must be mental, it must be spiritual, it must be emotional, it must address our purpose in life and it must cement our presence and authority. And so storytelling rebuilds an identity. It heals and reconciles us with the, with the parts of us that we were disconnected from. It challenges the colonial mindset and it corrects misconceptions. If we understand the power of storytelling as a decolonizing tool, we wield it with such power that all who come under the influence of that tool has to be changed. That's all I have to say as we start on this. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this group. I'm Dr. Marcia Thomas. I am a Christian leadership consultant and life coach. I am a story writer and I embrace story writing to do just this, change mindsets, change lives, change outcomes. But I do it with persons together because I am also change. So we, we want to understand that this, and we, we want to tell it, we want to become disciples of decolonization through our storytelling in our settings, in our context, in our environment. And we want to convince ourselves that it is very important so that we give it the importance that it requires. And we embrace change first in our minds, in our beings, in our spirits, so that we can convince others to do the same because decolonization by itself is a painful traumatic process that cannot be entered lightly. And as we are healed, the step to healing begins when we continue to share the parts of us that are healing so they can be strengthened and the wounds that we carry do not fester. They are clean and they are eradicated. So we can embrace the power we have been given by God to use the capabilities, the identities, the variety that we have to build and not break down, to help and not hinder. Those are the things that storytelling does as a decolonizing tool. Thank you, Obi. Thank you so much, sister. We appreciate you. We appreciate the, those in-depth uh, intervention. Uh, also from uh, that of uh, Sister Gloria and Akasha, I appreciate you deeply. Uh, this is very important. You see, each time we are together talking about these things, I really feel very proud that we are doing the right thing. And of course, I also want to thank the people in the audience. I've seen uh, Lenny, uh, David, uh, Yeman, I uh, see Khalid. Uh, okay, Mosidisi, I already mentioned your name. I uh, see Charlie. Uh, Cyrus, thank you for joining us again. Anna, Regina, thank you. And uh, Jean. Uh, Jean, I think you were raising your hand to join us and uh, make uh, a contribution. But you then went back to the to the to the listing again. But if you want, you can you can raise your hand again. We we'll add it to the conversation so we can learn from you. I see also uh, Sister Violet. Thank you so much for joining us. If any of you feel that 
there is something that touched you personally and you want to share, please come to the stage and share. We are interested in learning also, also from you because uh, all of us feel what is happening here. I believe all of us feel it. Uh, there, is, there is no way you cannot feel what is happening here because we are essentially saying that uh, it is time for us to reclaim our agency. It is time for us to reclaim our dignity. It is time for us to see the reality through our lenses, not through the lenses of other people, which is what colonialism actually did. And it wasn't just for the sake of seeing reality, but that your way of seeing reality, which is our way of seeing reality, was actually demonized so much to the point that we needed to be ashamed of who we are. And this was baked into us from very infancy, and we live it through our adulthood. And it is manifested in very many ways. So that when you look around yourself, you will just be ashamed of who you are as an African. So that when you are in the midst of a conversation, somebody come call you to come and express your own, you will have nothing to express because you have not been told that there is something valuable about you that there is, there is an inheritance that you are having, that there is something of dignity about you, that your color means something significant, that the way you laugh is important, that the way you sound is also important, that you are an important part of the human family. Colonialism strip us away all this. So when we say decolonizing, we're actually saying we want to reclaim that. We want to reclaim that which is naturally us. We are not saying, let's go start and start fighting other people. That's not what we are talking about. We are saying reclaiming our dignity. And by this dignity, we are saying we are using the power of storytelling. Because first, you need to even know that you have this dignity before you can reclaim it. Storytelling helps us to do that because by storytelling, we talk about this dignity. We talk about this idea that your father and your mother make sacrifices for you. That is nothing less compared to other people whose father and mother also make sacrifices for them. For the father, yours, are Africa, does not mean anything less. It means they have made sacrifices for you. They need to be celebrated for what they have done for you. I am saying your father because that is the closest thing that we can see. But when we talk of our ancestors, that is actually what it means. That several years ago, people stood up to defend their integrity. Many of them were actually crushed. And the narrative of the day is that we should forget those people. It is a bygone. One day I was talking about African history, and of course, I was making comparison of what is happening here. A friend of mine, an Italian, was saying, Ah, but you see, when you start saying those things, you will not be able to go far here. I'm not saying this person is an is not an ordinary, this is a, a professor uh, who is knowledgeable, who understands what he's saying, and he's telling me this. That because I want to be accepted, I should not talk about these things because it makes people feel bad. You see? So I should feel bad. I shouldn't make you feel bad. This is a conversation that I've come up again and again, particularly in the United States, that when you bring out such topics as critical race theory, those in the power um, position uh, think that you shouldn't talk about those things because when you do, you are going to make people feel bad. So I should just remain in my, uh, in my suffering, in my suffering alone. Even though my suffering was actually caused by you, I shouldn't make you feel bad by saying that I am suffering. Can you see how unjust the system is? Anyway, I, I want to uh, put a question to Nakasha. Nakasha, what method do you see as the best that we should maybe adopt to better use storytelling as a way to decolonize our, our mindset. Interesting. I, I think that there's not one approach. I think the beauty of um, having conversations like this with 
people from you know diverse backgrounds and diverse like socializations like no one on this call has the same socialization is that um you know everyone has a different approach towards to their storytelling like if we were to eat to go down the line is to, like tell you our experience with um racism or capitalism or our views or whatever the case may be each of us would have such a, a different experience of it and then a different approach to tell you those stories um i think the biggest thing that i try to inspire people to do is to just start with you know getting in the habit of understanding that you like your story is important like what happens to you is important in the power of uh documentation whether it's um documentation of your own personal life or the people around you like your family um talking to your family a lot of people don't talk to their family members or if they do talk to their family members they're not really inquiring to their family members as to like what happened to them in their life so that knowledge isn't that wisdom isn't being passed down um so i think getting in the habit of of documentation and it doesn't have to be writing it down it could just be like asking questions to your elders and listening to it so you can at least have that oral story to like pass down and to have a frame of reference as to like where you're coming from so you can have a, a in-depth understanding of where your story may have begun or how far it can go uh, I, I think that the biggest thing is understanding the power of your story and how it then connects to a bunch of other people's stories so sometimes like someone may tell a story and people are like so happy that they told the story because you know a whole thousands of people had similar things but they were just too scared to share or whatever the case may be so just the power of knowing that um people do care people do want to listen and there's uh di there's unity and diversity so Thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I like uh, your approach there that we don't really need to go very far. Uh, we can actually start from our family, from where we are, because every one of us is coming from a family. Who does it come from a family? You see, um, a couple of months ago, I terminated a book I wrote about my eldest brother, which is actually, uh, I can say, a book I write about my family. And writing that book actually opened up my eyes in very many ways. In that, um, it was the first time actually that I would be writing that in-depth analysis of my family. Uh, putting my family on paper like that, it was really healing even for me because now I could see in picture um, how we have been evolving as a family, you No, know? looking at my father, uh, who, of course, uh, died when I was in primary two. And then looking at my mother, looking at the sacrifices that my mother made. Now, by sacrifices, let me just give you an instance. You see, uh, we lived in a, in a village uh, in Amedo here, Urumi, which is south of Nigeria. Uh, because there was no really enough money uh, in the family, my mother was doing tedious work to cater for her children. You know, that is what I often say, that we are no product of charity. We are product of the sacrifices of people. She need to go to the wood, to the forest, little forest around us, to cut firewood. She would literally lift it on her head, take it to the house, and she would from there take it away to the town to say, she was doing this to care for us. This is the sacrifices that she has made. Now, what I understand, put it, writing that story, in fact, I did say it uh, in some time in the book that, okay, because the story is a little bit long because now, okay, my, my mother is dead now too. Uh, because my father uh, was late, so the responsibility was basically lifted on my, the first child in our, not only the first child, but the first male child in the family, which is uh, my eldest brother. And they have to take care of us, all of us. So that book was actually written to celebrate what he have done, a kind of an appreciation for that gesture. Because nobody forced him to do that. He decided out of his benevolence, out of his goodwill to take care of his younger ones. So 
I think when we talk about storytelling, looking at it like that, it is not difficult to understand because we are talking of something that we are used to, something of my brother, my father. You see, you know these people, you know what they have done, what they have done for you or what they have done against you. You know this story, you can tell it from the point of view of we, our story, because you'll be there. I remember, for example, as a child, say around the age of between like five and six, that was when my father died. But before then, I remember going to the farm with my father. I remember many of us in the family going together to weed or to cultivate. I, rem- I can see, like, smell the sweat of my father. Uh, as he was walking, or that of my elder brother, we were walking together, uh, maybe uh, planting yam, or maybe planting cassava, or maybe harvesting, or maybe weeding, or maybe clearing the, the, the farmland where they need to be planted. This is the story of us. This is how we are becoming. This is important for us. But you see, now let me share something here. That what I've come to understand, because by doing this work, I am also telling the story of other people. I have come to understand that most of this story actually fade into memory. I would never remember them anymore. Because, of course, except maybe you are from the royal family now, somebody have sat down to document your story. When you die, after a few years, you are you are forgotten. You basically disappear from the memory or the people, because how we live in memory is that somebody literally need to remember you. How do you remember somebody through the experiences? It doesn't mean that the people who we do not remember didn't have any experience. It's just that somebody have not taken the time to document those experiences. So that is why I think what Nakasha was saying there is very crucial. You know, we need to take the time to document our passes, those of our family, at least those close to us. At least we don't need to do much research now because you know these people. Just document your experiences, share with them. I'm not saying this is the simplest thing to do, but it is important because it helps us to heal ourselves and it helps also the children that are going to come so that they know the passes of their generation. Otherwise, it looks like illusion. It looks like something that is not real. But how can, you, how can you be real and where you come from is not real? It is impossible. So we need to do this work intentionally. I think Sister Gloria was saying that before. We need to be intentional about this work, that we know why we are doing it. We know why. At this time, this time, right now, we are here. We are not here because we didn't have anything to do. Uh, You see, Dr. Marcia run her business the same with uh, uh, Sister Gloria. They abandoned all that time. They are here. That is intention. They are doing this intentionally because they believe that what they are doing have a meaning, have a reason. That is intentionality about that. This is what it should be. Let's take the time to keep the memory of our existence. It is important. It's the minimum that we can do so that somebody can make a record of this someday. Now, talking about this again, I would like to pass the mic to a Sister Gloria. And this time, I'm asking, uh, because she's an expert on ancestral healing, how would ancestral healing help to decolonize our narrative, because again, it's about the narrative. Please help us. Thank you, Brother Obey. You know, with me, I always go around the, the, the what do you call it? I, I, I veer away from the immediate question because I always have a variety of things to say. And thank you for always indulging me in that. So the thing with the ancestral stories, um, ancestral healing, you know, Many ancestral lineage stories were marginalized or erased by colonial powers. And by resurrecting these stories, we give voice to the silenced forgotten. I was just saying to Brother Obehi earlier that 
our cultural, historical African ancestors will be well pleased with him and they will empower him to keep the, as he keeps their names and voices alive. Brother Obey writes about honoring uh, African heroes. He tells their stories with vigor and intentionality. When you read, at least for me, when I read those stories, I can feel his intentions. I can feel the vigor. I can feel how much it's important to him that these stories are read, are heard, and people can get empowered from them. I know I do. I've learned so much about our African kings and warriors, our heroes from Brother Obehi's stories. And every time I read about them, like I said, I feel, I feel their energy come through me. I feel proud. I feel empowered. And it, 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 it cancels away, it chips away just a bit from all those negative narratives and biases that constantly are being told. So we also have to be constant and intentional with our stories. Because these people don't let up. I go back again to um, this recent visit of uh, Meghan and, and Harry. And I was stunned with the lies, just blatant lies. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if any of you listened to some of those things. Some of the things that they were saying about Nigeria. I don't deny you know, some of the problems of the continent. But, but a lot of the things they were saying just because of the hate they feel were just outright lies. So I'm saying if these people have the nerve, the audacity to speak on us like that, my goodness, we need to also speak our truth. We have no excuse. We need to research, reflect, create spaces, educate, empower. You know, storytelling is very powerful as a decolonizing tool. And once, once we understand that, we, we will see the, the absolute need to embrace the power of our storytelling, the stories of our ancestors. And through storytelling, we heal, transform, and liberate everyday conversations, sharing stories of his, his, historical African figures and local community leaders during family meals or social gatherings, these stories counteract negative stereotypes and reinforce a sense of pride and identity. Integrating storytelling in education, like my, my sister uh, Marcia said, using digital platforms for storytelling, social media and blogs, sharing personal and ancestral stories, written narratives and publications. It provides an alternative narrative to mainstream publications and rich in literary landscapes and definitely providing representation, our representation. Storytelling as a daily practice empowers individuals and communities to reclaim their narratives, challenge colonial perspectives, and foster a deep con connection with their heritage. And by integrating these examples into daily life, Africans and those in the diaspora can continuously work towards a decolonized and rich empowered identity. Our ancestors demand of us to reclaim our narratives, to empower our communities, to inspire future generations, to embrace the power of storytelling, to decolonize and heal every day. You know, part of ancestral lineage healing, again, this is one of the areas where we've been taught to, to deny, to, you know, um, to hate, to you know, to, uh, to continue in the negative narratives about our ancestors. But ancestral healing, when you think of it, and what is ancestral healing lineage? It's, and it's about honoring our ancestors, about speaking on the, the struggles that they've been through, to look into them for wisdom. Why wouldn't we do that? Our grandfathers, our great grandfathers, I mean, if, if we have any elders still living, ask them about their mothers, about their fathers, read about them. All that information is there, even if you don't have living uh, relatives to, to ask about, all the information is there. You can read about your people so that you, and when you read about them, you will feel it. 
my grandmother always said, when you hear the truth, you know it. And then when you juxtapose with some of the rubbish that is being spoken every day, it, 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 it makes me incensed with anger. And I say to myself, I have to channel my anger. And, and, and the best way to do that is come to these spaces, go to other spaces, support my brothers and sisters, lift them up, tell my stories. No, it's my children who encouraged me to tell my stories because I, I, didn't, I didn't deny my stories, but I didn't think they were important. And they were the ones, they say from the mouths of babes, they were the ones who said, mom, you know, you have an amaz amazing history. You tell us about our grandparents. You tell us about, our, you know, your, your great grand aunt. And I look at their faces when I'm telling them these stories. They look, they, I, I feel as if I'm putting, I'm feeding them. I'm putting uh, something into them because I can see the transformation even in them. And it was through them that I thought, hang on a sec. I've taken these things for granted. No, we're living in times where we cannot take it for granted because there are people working overtime to keep those stories on, you know, to, to, to erase those stories, to change those stories, to speak on us in ways that I, I hear things and I say, that's not, you're not talking about me, but I've, because through my work with ancestral lineage healing, I am now, those things are like, I feel like I have a, a, a bulletproof uh, uh, jacket. Those things bounce off me because I'm saying, that, that's not, you're not talking about me. That's not me, you know, because I know who I am. I know who I've come from. I come from kings and queens. I come from warriors. No, you can't, you can't talk about me like that. But then if, if I don't talk about myself, if I don't talk about my stories, I don't find out about my people, my culture, my traditions. And so in my own way, integrate it. Yes, I'm living in, in the West and to a lot of, to a large extent, I will incorporate you know, the ways of, of the West to a point, but not override mine, no way. So this ancestral lineage healing is a way of understanding that you know, we have identities that we need to reclaim and our voices are needed. Our ancestors will, will never forgive us if we do not speak up and let people hear who we are. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. Uh, this is really beautiful. This is really beautiful. Uh, this is what we really should be doing every day. Uh, you see, we are nourishing ourselves now. Uh, yes, we are nourishing ourselves by talking. Now, personally, I have learned a lot uh, talking with people who share also their experiences. I first started to get snippet of this when I started to learn Italian language. And that was several years ago when I came here to Italy and I started to learn Italian language because there is one thing I hate. I don't want people to translate for me in the language of a place that I live. It will never happen. In fact, I do translate for people, even though sometimes these are the people that have been here uh, before me and that I, I met them here. But what I'm actually trying to say there is that by learning, by trying to learn something, a different perspective, you come to know yourself even better. You come to have a deeper understanding of yourself because now you are going to make comparison. They say like this, but how does that mean when you translate it into your own thing? And uh, this can be really very powerful. You know, right now we are sharing. As you listen to what Dr. Matsia is saying, listen to what uh, Sister Gloria is saying or what uh, Nakasha is saying, there is no way you cannot make something new out of it today. And this is also our power, our ability to absorb, analyze, and then come up with a different uh, information. So this is important. We need to do this and we need to continue to do this. I hear Sister Gloria talking about bulletproof, and I think that is what it really should be. In that if you know whom you are, if you know your story, your origin, your source, if you know that there are literally thousands of ancestors that are standing to defend you, you should not be afraid. But of course, you need to do the right thing. 
When you have done that, don't be afraid. That is it. Now, this is another thing again that probably uh, we are, that is not the topic of today. But because we are talking about Africa, it is impossible not to even touch a bit about uh, African spirituality. Now, this is something uh, that I don't write about quite often. Uh, the other day, I said I wanted to write about Ehi. Ehi is about um, a kind of your uh, spiritual guidance in Eastern language, in Eastern spirituality, uh, the like of uh, what you find in, among the Yoruba as Ori, or you find among the Igbo as Chi. These are uh, African understanding of life that before you were born, there is a guidian that is assigned to you, is sort of leading you through life. You will die. Your guidian doesn't die. He returns to where he came from. Then you return back again. You are really in this process that never ends. But what sin do we make out of that? I was saying it also a couple of days ago, uh, talking with my guest, that in a Judeo-Christian uh, understanding or Western, Euro-Western understanding, we have a concept that is called end of the world. The world is going to end. Like, uh, we are going to face judgment at the end of the day where you are going to either go to hell, fire, or go to hell. I was saying, hmm, how do we explain this in African spirituality? Because at least from the way that I understand it, I put it in this, in this article that I wrote, because usually I write like about 1,200 words of article, but in this article, I wrote it over 5,000 words to explain the concept of a heap. Now, when you die, at least from our understanding, from our spirituality, the idea that you are going to face judgment of going to have fire or, in fact, in the Catholic Church, because I've been a Catholic member for a very long time, we will have something that is not actually have fire or heaven. It's called uh, purgatory. Purgatory is a kind of a punishing place where you go to atone, you go for atonement there from there. I think you have to face a second judgment now, whether you are going to have heaven or have fire. But all these are sort of different from the way we understand it. You know, now, in African spirituality or in Eastern spirituality, let me be specific on that, you are in a perpetual journey of trying to be divine. So you can come as many times as you want. The only thing that is separating you from ascending to becoming a better version of yourself is if you do something wrong. Therefore, it's not even that somebody is punishing you. God is not even punishing you. You are being punished by your act. If you do what is wrong, you reduce your level. If you do what is right, you ascend higher. Now, this might appear very um, ordinary, but it is profound. In that if you know that doing bad takes you low and doing good takes you higher, then you need to choose what are you going to do. Do you want to go low or go high? So all this becomes very important for us now when we are talking about understanding who we are. So that somebody will tell you, I will kill you. No, it depends. if you know who you are, you know that that person really do not have power over you. Because remember I talked just now of Ehi. Of course, I really didn't explain it in detail. But nobody, no mere mortal can kill your Ehi. Your Ehi lives forever. So that you even have the permission of living forever. So nobody can threaten you. If you know who you are, you literally have bulletproof. I think this is important. I, I really think it's important. And I thank you so much for mentioning that, uh, Sister Gloria, that if you know yourself, you have bulletproof. It is true. Now, I have a question for uh, Dr. Matsia. Uh, because Dr. Matsia have published a book, an interesting one, talking about leadership. And in Africa and among African diaspora, leadership is particularly important for us. You see, today we're talking about uses storytelling as a decolonizing tool. If what we have in Africa are neo-colonialists or people who are simply working for the metropoles, then it's not going to work because it requires a lot of effort for us to decolonize the system because we need to talk about the education. 
There are some countries in Africa, I'm not really going to be mentioning name, where the educational material they use to educate the people are literally coming from France. It's under the France Educational Ministry, Ministry of Education, that they design, they design the curriculum that is going to these so-called France Afriques, countries in Africa that are supposed to be independent, but they are under France. In that case, how can you decolonize a system like that? We need leadership. A leader who know the destination of the people, who the people are rallied around us. Hey, hey, we are going to this direction. We need to do this, then do that, then do that, then do that, because it's going to lead us to this way and this way. They have a destination. We need good leaders in Africa. So the question to the, uh, to the other man is, how would good leadership and storytelling contribute to our understanding of the world from our perspective? Help us with that. That is a very good question, very interesting, intriguing one, because um, in my mind, as a leader and also as a writer, I'm presently putting out a, another book that talks, as, that appeals to young leaders with some power texts that would guide them on how to ignite their faith, for, to build resilience in their field as faith-based professionals. And, and I am framing the concept that good leadership and storytelling in itself are instrumental, very instrumental in shaping how we see the world and how we operate in the world and how we secure our place as masters of our own destinies. And so I believe that leaders guide and inspire and storytellers connect and educate. And so those two put together a leader that embraces storytelling as a tool of information, a tool of compassion, and a tool of connection will always be a role model that will impact persons in a way that will allow them to also share their challenges and triumphs and help to provide reassurance as a foundation for overcoming present obstacles or a mode of, in of instilling confidence and resilience in others. And so that is one of the things that I think leaders can do. Good leadership and good leaders provide the vision and the integrity for persons as role models, for persons to tell their story and to articulate it very clearly and well. And so there is the adage that says, if you want to know what to do, where you are going and do it well, you must always ask someone that is coming back. And so for me, that's what leadership does. And that's what storytelling combined with the right leader does. Articulate a clear vision and direction and help the persons who are depending on us to understand the complex issues and navigate the uncertainties that come from not knowing yourself, not having the right mindset, being, being, being bogged down for so long, help persons to overcome their traumatic experiences, help people to live in the present and help people to do what I call pivot with power. There is a clear course that leaders can set for decolonization that will enable individuals and communities that they want to connect and that they want to evolve, improve, that they want to, 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 to claim ownership and identity. And, and good leaders in this way focus their efforts on achieving a common goal. They inspire and motivate persons through their, not only their action, their words, but also through their actions. And they communicate this sense of purpose and possibility by how they frame their lives and how they move. They encourage people to change their outcomes and to, to, to they foster unity 
of a shared vision, vision. They also help persons to become more inclusive and also accepting of diversity. So persons, they build emotional intelligence in people. They look at how these things trigger people and how their responses, interpretations, and motives trigger others. And so there is a building of trust that is prioritized by these good leaders that enrich the understanding of the world of experiences, binding them together, classifying them, using them as stepping stones, knowing what to discard, knowing what to keep, and knowing when to fold and when to run. And so these things, leaders build a cooperative environment and provide a sense of safety and security where people can express their their feelings, their concerns, their sh- challenges, their issues, their misconceptions, their perceptions, and and, 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 and and feel that they are not attacked or not subdued, but feel really supported and uplifted and empowered to make the change of the mindset change, to distribute resources properly. To, because they, as leaders, distribute resources properly, tell the story, the truth, tell the truth. And so there is now a, a, a reinvigorating of, of what tradition is, what it means, and how our cultural practices influence us. There is also this decolonization of the education system to reflect who persons really are, the legacies that are embedded there, the wealth, the values, the perspective, instead of the colonial narratives. They, they lead the way and address the equalities that exist and, 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 and the, the psychological displacement that are forced on persons during the period of how we are colonized. And, and colonization in itself is, is, is requires an decolonization, requires an imp- emancipation of the mind. And so we, 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 we have movements that are advocated by leaders, good leaders, for the rights and sovereignty of these in, of, of indigenous groups and the reassessing and reforming of the curriculum if we are brave enough and we have that courage to, to include the diverse perspective. And I think it is Nick Kosia that was highlighting those things and the justice and the initiatives that we need through love, unconditional love, and the policies that we must address to, to, to stem and to eradicate, and if not eradicate, diminish to a large extent the historical injustices that have been placed upon us because persons see themselves as superior or different. And so leaders really and truly helping the march to to encourage a strong sense of self and cultural pride and so they rebuild person's identity and play a very integral part in addressing the traumas inflicted by person's experiences and foster the sense of community and collective personal and collective well-being as we overcome the internalized beliefs that people have then in 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 a the superiority, the, the superiority, sorry, of a, what would I say now, a colonial culture and the inferiority of, of our unique culture. Leaders, good leaders, effective leaders, through storytelling, through empowering, through inspiration, through motivation, through a strong sense of duty and responsibility, challenge these colonial mindsets, you know, whatever shape or form they present themselves and become advocators for change, change that is from within and demonstrated the results become an outward show of who we are, who we truly are, who we have become and how we are adopting to make this world a better place for those who we serve and those who serve alongside us. Thank you so much for that, Edith Tomazia. I appreciate you. Uh, th- those are really very important. Thank you. That is uh, an in-depth analysis also uh, why it is important for us to consider the role of leadership because we simply cannot 
I do these things without good leadership. So that is why it is important. All right, so we got to the point where now uh, each of us sort of give a final take to conclude the conversation because it will be very inspiring here and full of value. I thank you for that. So I will start with the Nakasha. Nakasha, what will be your final take here to conclude the conversation? And remember to tell the people how to connect with you. Yeah, um, thank you for Lady Drew who just spoke. Um, gave me some positive feelings. And I would say the best way to continue to decolonize your mind is to understand that it's an ongoing process we're taught we're saying the words unconditional love but it's really difficult and until you get into a situation where you actually have to practice that um which is is every day right when someone pisses you off like you still have to show them unconditional love whether it's family or a stranger whatever the case may be it's an ongoing process as to what our relationships are with each other um and so yeah remembering that remembering how you show up for yourself um your decisions that you're making like is it that you're scared that you're not going to have a way of living and that's why you're not doing what god told you to do like your passion your purpose whatever the case may be um and so yeah i challenge you to challenge yourself to be unconditionally loving to yourself and then that's going to pour into other people you can connect with me on linkedin or um, also, my website at www.nkozi-a.com or my website at moresearch.org. Thank you so much for coming and listening. Peace. Thank you so much for that. That is great. That is great. All conditional love. That is really very important. There is nothing that is more powerful than the power of love. If we love ourselves, then we will even understand what it means to love other people. And of course, we need to love other people too, because we are not alone in this world. We are sharing this space. Yeah. All right. So I move to Sister Gloria. What is your final take? I please tell people how to connect with you. Okay. And thank you, everybody who has spoken. Um, ancestral lineage healing and storytelling are intricately linked in the journey towards decolonization. Ancestral lineage healing is the process of acknowledging, understanding, and healing the traumas and legacies inherited from our ancestors. And decolonizing storytelling is reclaiming and reshaping narratives that reflect authentic, diverse, and indigenous perspectives. You know, the legacy of ancestral trauma, you know, look, that colonialism inflicted upon us is profound. It, uh, colonialism inflicted profound trauma on African societies, disrupting cultural continuity and creating deep psychological and social wounds. We can't underestimate how deeply those wounds have gone, intergenerational. The trauma is often passed down through generations, influencing identity, behavior, and perception. So there's a lot of work we have to do. And storytelling offers a means to articulate and process these inherited traumas. Through stories, we can explore, acknowledge the pain, the resilience, and wisdom of our ancestors, facilitating healing and growth. So once again, I will repeat what I said a, a bit earlier. Our ancestors demand of us to reclaim our narratives, to empower our communities, to inspire future generations, to embrace the power of storytelling, to decolonize and heal every day. I want to say bless you all for lending your energy, your support, your heart to make this um, audio today, this audio room as interesting as it, as it has been and to bring life to the topic today and to be a source of information and healing. Bless you all, Ashe. And you can find me, um, I'm on LinkedIn, and my uh, website is gloriaogumbadejo.com. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that, Sister Gloria. Okay, Dr. Marcia, what is your final thought here to continue, to conclude? My final point would be that um, decolonization is a multifaceted process. And so, because we want to dismantle the structures and legacies of misconceptions that have been forced upon us and have been fortified in our spirits, we want to make sure that we exercise patience and that our stories are genuine and that they are authentic and that we 
they are intentional and focused and that they are not just stories for stories, but they must carry a message. They must have a theme and they must have an arm of empowerment that will make people heal and they make them carry the well-being that is supposed to be a holistic well-being. As we understand that and the power of storytelling and actively engaging this crusade or this mission, we, we, we want to understand that the ultimate aim is for emancipation towards a more equitable and just existence and a more contented and accepting way of life of diverse cultures and histories that are now acknowledged and respected. There is where we want it to end. I can be contacted at drtpmotivate2.com, which is my website. I also can, you can also share in my newsletter, in my blog, in my, on my YouTube channel, and also on Instagram and LinkedIn. I also have a feature on Facebook. I want to say thanks to everyone who joined us and to you, Obi, for always having these explosive and very practical and relatable rooms and for always sharing with my esteemed colleagues, Gloria and Nikisha, I, I feel that we are making a difference. And no matter how minute, collectively, we are having a cascading effect that even if it is not a monumental change, it is gradually taking root and allowing persons to think and to embrace the possibility that we all can become masters of our own destiny and share equally in changing our world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Dr. Matsya. And I thank, of course, to uh, uh, Lakasha and uh, Sister Gloria. I appreciate the sharing. And of course, also Lady Drew, who shared something. And of course, those in the audience too, who have been listening to us, we appreciate each and every one of you. We are not taking you for granted at all. Uh, I, I think I just want to repeat what I was saying at the beginning, that we believe that we can do this together. No single one of us can do all this work because it is hard work. And for us to be able to make better impact, we need to uh, put our effort together. That is why in A classes, we're only looking for uh, different experts who are willing to co-create solution. We co-create solution for our people. So if you believe that you are able to add your knowledge uh, in a way that it can be useful to the people, please reach out to us. We are looking for people who are willing to co-create solution uh, to our audience. That is very important for us. Uh, talking of this um, decolonization, uh, using storytelling as a tool. I think the message has been driven home here, and I really, of course, I am grateful to the speakers here. The story, the power of storytelling is inestimable. And of course, uh, I'm not going to really go down and be explaining every part of it. Uh, that is why there is a free chapter from my book, The Storytelling Mastery, that it is free for you to take and read if you are interested in learning about uh, storytelling, because storytelling can be useful to you in every area of, of your life, particularly if you are in business or you are in the business of communicating with people because people actually listen to story. Story is magic and we can use it to build ourselves and we can use it to decolonize also our mindset. So I want to thank all of you for being here and I encourage you to come around again because every 40 days we are here taking on a different argument on the topic of storytelling within the African diaspora. So thank you again, each and every one of you. Talk to you 40 days from now. <laughs>